First, it boiled water for steam engines. Then, it ignited petrol in combustion engines and generated power for steam turbines. And more recently, the controlled energy from nuclear reactors has been converted to electrical energy. And what does it add up to, all this application of different forms of energy? It adds up to a surplus. The creation of the surplus means that the time saved by the wheel on a cart or the lever on an engine can be used to make more goods. You can either use these goods or you can exchange them. Or you could use them to provide services. Nurses or teachers or postmen or firemen. Or you could use them to provide leisure for yourself. So when we take advantage of a combination of mechanical devices, natural resources and our own efforts, we create a surplus. And that surplus provides us with the standard of living we have today in our modern world. You know, I've been thinking. Oh, yes. And what have you been thinking? Well, I've been thinking that it's thinking that got us where we are today. Hmm? Well, I followed your first bit about you having been thinking again, but I got lost on the second bit of thinking. Well, well, just look at our village today. Yeah, so I'm looking. What can you see? Hmm, well... Uh, I can see a group of people who aren't exactly living off the fat of the land, but they are doing very nicely, thank you. Right. And how did this happen when, not all that long ago, we lived in a subsistence economy? Oh, now I see what you mean. You mean which pieces of thinking, which ideas, took us from one level of prosperity to another? Right. Why? Hmm. It's quite simple, really. Subsistence is the economy we started out with, and a surplus is what we've got now. Yes. And the way we got from one to the other was by specialisation and by mechanisation. Sometimes a bit of one, sometimes a bit of the other, and sometimes a bit of both. Do you remember what it was like, living in a subsistence economy? Oh, could I ever forget. We used to spend all our time and energy just getting ourselves enough food to stay alive. And there was never anything left over. And then we discovered division of labour by product. Oh, yes, what a day that was. <laughs> it certainly was. We divided labour by product, which just meant that instead of every family doing everything for itself, one family specialised in sheep, one in cattle. Another specialised in fish. Another in tailoring and cloth making. Oh, that was us. Yes, and as a result, eight families produced enough to feed ten, which left two families with nothing to do. So, they built the bridge, which took our cattle across to new pastures. And then, they had time to dig the irrigation channel, which took the water to more of our crops. Do you remember what happened then? Yes, then came division of labour by process. Until then, to make anything, one person had always done everything. I used to do everything from shearing the sheep to weaving the cloth, one process after another. It was slow, and I wasn't very good at all of it. So, we decided to specialise in one process each. Hmm. One did all the shearing. Another the washing. Yeah, another the spinning. And another did the dyeing. Another, the weaving. Another, for finishing. And the result was that the same amount of people produced twice as many shawls by working together, one process each, as they would have done making complete shawls by themselves. And, what's more, the shawls were much better made. Oh, thank you very much. Anyway, that's how we left our subsistence economy behind, to produce our surplus. It was our first great idea. We specialised. 
We specialised by product and we specialised by process. And our second great idea was... We mechanised. We had ideas for new devices and we had ideas to harness horses and oxen. In our family's case, our greatest idea for mechanisation and our most useful device was the wheel. Oh, yeah, you can say that again. The wheel meant that the children could bring home in one go what would previously have taken you and me six journeys. Do you remember that day when you thought of saving your own strength by letting the animals do the work for you? <laughs> oh, yes. What a great day that was. Yeah. Animal muscle power. But it was nothing compared to what's happened since we discovered how to harness the forces of nature. Yeah. There was the energy of wind. And the energy of water. And eventually, there was the energy of coal. And the energy of oil. And linking these sources of energy to our mechanical devices meant that we could till soil, draw water, grind corn and produce all kinds of things far more quickly than simply by using our own muscles. Mechanisation was the second step out of the subsistence economy. We mechanised by inventing devices and by using natural forces to add to our own efforts. And it was specialisation and mechanisation that gave us our surplus. But what is the surplus? What is it that specialisation and mechanisation gave us? First, we now have stores of food that will last us through the winter. We have a few luxuries to tide us over until the harvest. Second, we have surplus food and manufactured goods that we can exchange for other things we want when the trader brings them. Third, we've built a bridge and a barn and a water wheel. We dug irrigation channels, we've made spinning wheels and ploughs and they help us protect or even increase our prosperity. Fourth, we can spare one or two people from the fields to serve the rest. Part of the surplus food can go to somebody who teaches the children and somebody who looks after the sick. And fifth, we have a bit of time to spare. We can play games occasionally, yeah, just, paint just beautiful pictures on our crockery or make beautiful clay figures. Oh. Or decorate our huts. So we applied our surplus to five different things. Reserves, in this case food. Trade. Capital, services, and leisure. All this may not seem much if you don't remember how they started out in a subsistence economy. I'll never forget it. Days of cold, sickness, hunger, days of backbreaking toil. It oh. all seems a long way away now. Yes, we have come a long way. Yeah. Of course, I don't really have to tell you that our community is imaginary. A valley like ours never really existed. Not exactly, anyway, but everything we've seen, everything we've talked about, really happened through the ages, in some community or another. Let's take a look at reality for a minute. This is how men once tried to set down their own reality. These are the actual pictures drawn by primitive men, showing their own lives as hunters and wanderers. And for all but a few thousand of his one or two million years on this planet, this is how man really lived. Hand to mouth, day to day, and place to place. He followed the herds, eating any wild animals he could kill, gathering whatever wild fruit and vegetables he could manage to find. But for most people, life began to change dramatically about 10,000 years ago, when human beings found the secret of staying in one place. The secret was farming, domesticating animals, pigs and cattle, sheep and goats, and cultivating crops. By finding that secret, man had stumbled on the path to prosperity. The first prosperous civilizations grew up in four great river valleys. The Yellow River in northeastern China, the Indus in Pakistan, the Tigris and Euphrates in modern Iraq and ancient Babylon, and the Nile in Egypt. And yet, if you look at those great fertile valleys today, you'll find a strange thing. 
They're now among the poorest of the world's nations, often unable to provide even enough food for their inhabitants. Until two or three hundred years ago, the richest countries were often the ones with the best land. But today, great industrial communities have been built up in the world using resources imported from other places. In other words, some of their wealth comes from foreign trade. There'll always be a strong disagreement about why some countries have followed the path to prosperity and others haven't. But of one thing there is little doubt. Those who have achieved it have done so by creating a surplus. A big surplus, using exactly the same method as we did in our community. This factory, like all factories, is the result of division of labour by product. And the product is television sets. It produces them in a whole lot of different stages. Division of labour by process. It's mechanised and the production is achieved through devices like wheels, levers, gears, hinges and pulleys. Most of the energy comes from electricity, supplied by harnessing the resources of nature, like water, coal, oil and uranium. As a result, a thousand people working in a factory like this turn out half a million sets a year. 500 a year each. Since they don't need them all for themselves, they've created a massive surplus of television sets to exchange. So in effect, they'll be swapped for other people's surpluses. For his share of the exchange, a worker in a factory gets food, clothing, heating, a house and a car from other workers who produced more of those things than they needed. He also gets roads, street lighting, a teacher for his children, a doctor and a policeman as well. And after all that, he still has his evenings free to watch a television. Oh, of course, he still has his problems and frustrations. But when you consider the subsistence level where it all started long ago, is there any doubt about which sort of life you would prefer? I can't believe it sometimes. Didn't come easy. Took a lot of hard work. It certainly did. The idea of each family in a community producing something different, dividing up the labour, mechanising, that's what made the difference. Mm. We make really wonderful clothes now. Oh, yeah. We've got a right to be proud. And the farmers produce terrific wheat and barley. Mm. The cowards are turning out the best beef and cream I've ever tasted. Pity about the shepherds. I'm getting a bit fed up with the shepherds. Though you've got to admit their mutton is better than anything we could produce, dear. When we manage to get any of it. Anyway, don't forget the fishers. That trout of theirs yesterday. Oh, oh. And our idea of putting everything we all produce into common stores so that every family can take what it needs works really well. Well, up to a point, anyway. We'd have had salmon yesterday if the shepherds hadn't got to the barn first. Mm. We had to have the fishers' trout instead. Still, it was better than anything we could have caught. Mm. Better food isn't the only advantage, you know. That's true enough. There's more food for everybody now. After all, when you spend all your time at your one job, you become more skilled at it. Our looms are the most efficient this valley has ever seen. We get ten times the amount of cloth from this beauty, and it doesn't take any more effort either. You've got to admire the fishers, though. Yes, that boat they made to get down the stream to fish in the lake Brilliant idea. And they spent all those evenings making a huge trawling net. Beautifully designed floats and everything. They must have increased their catch 20 times over with that net. The masons increased their productivity in just the same way. So have the farmers and the shepherds. I know all about the shepherds, thank you very much. 
you do go on about the shepherds, dear. Yeah, and with reason. There they are. Look at it again. Not, not again. This week, all they've put in the barn is one mangy lamb. And what are they taking out of the common food, you may ask? It does look a bit suspect. Would you believe it? And they've got three times as many sheep as the cowards have got cattle. Oh. Mrs Coward knows what they're up to. They're cheating and salting away all her beef for a rainy day. Mind you, Mrs Coward doesn't have much right to complain. She walked off with all the best raspberries last week. We've got to face facts, you know. This idea of a common pool hasn't worked out as well as you thought it would. Yes, and we're not the only ones who think so. <coughs> this business of sharing doesn't work. Um, it's not fair. By the time our family gets to the barn, the best stuff is gone. The share-out is far from equal. And it's not only that. Look what's happening now. Just because there's a glut of vegetables that nobody wants, we have to throw away all those turnips. After all that work, too. And don't forget that terrible row over the raspberries. Um, disgraceful behaviour. After that, Mr Mason thought we should put him in charge of everything. Oh, that man makes me so mad. Ooh, look at him showing off. He said because he was the strongest person in the valley, he'd guarantee to make sure that everybody would put everything into the barn. He said he would personally divide it all up and issue everybody with their own share. Yeah, I'll bet he would. Anyway, we all knew what that would mean, having your head knocked in by Mr Mason. Well, you had a bright idea. No, I had an inspiration. I suddenly had the notion of nobody putting any produce into the barn at all and everybody keeping everything they made for themselves. <laughs> Mrs Fisher immediately said that would mean they'd eat nothing but fish for the rest of their lives. <laughs> and Mr Carpenter asked you if you expected him to eat hammers and nails for his supper. <laughs> Yes, he oh. did, as a matter of fact. And Mrs Farmer said, where was she supposed to get new clothes when the old ones wore out? Well, it did seem a reasonable question in the circumstances. But it was. I, I, I mean, it is. Don't you see? We can't possibly wear all the clothes we make, but we do need corn and milk, and we do need fruit and fish, and we do need all the other things everybody else makes and grows. So? So, we'd swap. <gasps> An inspiration! That's what they all said. Mr Fisher immediately noticed that if the shepherds didn't produce enough sheep, they wouldn't have anything to exchange. And Mrs Carpenter said, Right, no mutton from the shepherds, and they don't get the fences from me for their lambing pens. And if the shepherds didn't like the new plan, they could lump it and leave. It would just mean more grazing for the cattle. We'd have just as much meat as before, but it would be beef instead of mutton. It's a way of making the shepherds behave, without having to put Mr Mason in charge of everything. Mm. Everybody was delighted. Although he's not that bright sometimes, even Mr Mason began to see how he would benefit. That's how we all agreed to have a swapping day, every week in the square in front of the big barn. Remember that first day? The fishers brought an enormous load of beautiful fresh salmon. Beautiful it was! Everybody swapped their cloth, their milk, their fruit, and even a stool from Mr Carpenter for the fish. Swapping worked so well, we began to do it every day. For things like raspberries and, and milk and fish that don't last, but we want every day. There was no end of what we could swap if somebody else wanted it. Even Mr Mason promised to build a jetty for the fishers if they would supply him with one salmon a week for the whole year. Yes, everybody thought it was a wonderful system, except the shepherds. They'd brought practically nothing to swap. When anyone made a bargain, it would be marked on the wall for everyone to see. That's why we called our square the Market Place. It became the busiest place in the village. In fact, it became the village centre. Oh dear, the shepherds had a pretty thin time that first day, especially as the fishers had brought along masses of salmon, which made up for the shortage of mutton. That night, the shepherds went home practically empty-handed, but the next week was a different story. The shepherds came back with an enormous supply of sheep. Mrs Shepherd said that last week, oh, she'd lost her sheep and didn't know where to find them till this week. And if you believe that, you'll believe anything. 
Well, as time went by, the market became the best family outing of the week. Not only did everyone discover the value of their produce for everyone else that day, they saw all their work rewarded. They discovered other things too. They found out what was happening in the village. They found out what people needed so that they knew what to provide next time. Of course, the word market didn't really originate from the mark on the wall of the barn. And the world we're living in these days is very different to the kind of life you saw in our village. But from time to time people do try to live without markets. The famous example is the kibbutz in Israel. Here everyone works for the community. But the most successful depend on growing or producing things which are then exported and sold in the markets of the world to provide money for the kibbutz's common pool. In return for their work, people get food and shelter. But few of the kibbutz are really self-sufficient. In the 1960s, many groups of hippies tried to make new lives for themselves by getting together to grow their own food, make their own clothes and even build their own villages. Their idea was to share everything equally, but not many of their communities flourished. Some people found life too hard, there were personality clashes and people walked out. Others needed doctors or medicines and when there weren't any they left too. But hippie communes that survived tended to specialise in crafts, leather work, gem work and jewellery. But to sell their work and to buy what they needed to live, they had to take their wares outside to the market. Like the people in a kibbutz, they quickly realised the undeniable advantages of a market to the survival of their chosen way of life. Markets just spring up spontaneously. Look at car boot sales. Nobody launched them, they just happened. Now tens of thousands of people go there every week. And when the internet arrived, it became a worldwide market in cyberspace. There are markets for everything. Big things, small things, even markets in ideas like leisure and holidays. Perhaps the commonest, everywhere in the world, are the markets for the food we eat. They are important meeting places too. People may go to buy and sell, but they don't miss the chance to catch up on the local news and discuss local issues. But along with all the swapping, there is an information system at work. Information about what there is to sell and what there is to buy. Information about what is scarce and what is plentiful. Information about what's not worth much and what is considered valuable. Markets that flourish do so because they work. If they didn't, they'd soon go out of business because voluntary transactions that don't work tend not to be repeated. People are like that, regardless of the control and politics of the societies in which they live. They come away from the market immediately satisfied with what they've acquired and what they've learnt. And that's the nature of every market in the world. It worked very well at first. What did? The market. <laughs> a bit too well, if you ask me. Right, I will ask you. Uh, what do you mean the market worked too well? Well, look what happened to the fishers. What did happen with the fishers? You remember their catches? Oh, of course I do. They catch salmon one night, perch the next, all lovely and fresh, two lots of wonderful fish on offer on their stall at the same time. Hmm, true. And what did they exchange their salmon for? Ah, they did very well out of that. For each load of salmon they were guaranteed to get uh, a dozen eggs, 12 bags of corn and a leg of lamb. Yeah, and what did they get for each load of perch? Well, they didn't do as well from that, did they? Uh, maybe only half a dozen eggs, three bags of corn and a couple of chops if they were lucky. Yeah, but they'd spent the same amount of time fishing for the salmon as they had for the perch, right? 
Mmm, true. But most people prefer salmon to perch any day, and you can understand why. It was the same with the turnips and the carrots. Oh, Mrs Farmer, you mean? Yeah. She soon yeah. found that Mrs Shepherd would only give her a leg of lamb for turnips. But for a load of carrots, she could get a leg of lamb, a couple of chops and a skein of wool. What's more, Mrs Farmer didn't have to work any harder to grow carrots rather than turnips. It's weird, isn't it? Not really. Mrs Shepherd just happens to be partial to carrots, that's all. <laughs> It's another example of a market giving people information. It tells you what people want and it tells you what people don't want. Same thing happened with those shawls I used to take to market. Mm. People seemed to get tired of the old favourite designs. Then, as soon as I started to take some of our jazzy new designs, they went like hot cakes, even though I was asking twice as much in exchange for them. Variety. That's what people want and that's what the market gave them. Choice. Mm. And that's where the trouble began. Mm. The more choice people had, the more complicated the market became. Complicated? I'll say it was complicated. Do you remember the time when we needed a dozen eggs? Oh, yes, do I not. It seemed the simplest thing in the world, didn't it? We'd just made a lovely new red cloak. Nothing seemed simpler than to take it along to Mrs Farmer's stall in the market mm. and swap it for her eggs. I know. But Mrs Farmer didn't want our nice new cloak that day. No, thank you very much, she said. I don't need a new cloak. What I want in exchange for my dozen eggs is something for our supper, like a nice fat salmon. Well, the fishers have a nice fat salmon, so we go along to the fishers with our lovely red cloak. Very nice indeed, says Mr Fisher, but what I actually want is butter. But of course, it's the cowards who have butter. And do they want our red cloak in exchange for it? Not on your life. What they need is a beautiful kitchen stool. And who makes stools? Mr Carpenter. Ah. And does he want our beautiful red cloak in exchange for it? Of course he doesn't want our beautiful red... He does? He does? <laughs> he really does want our beautiful red cloak in exchange for his rotten old stool. Quick, quick! <laughs> so, by swapping our cloak for the stool, the stool for the butter, the butter for the salmon, and the salmon for the eggs, we got what we wanted in the first place. What a hassle for just a few eggs. Whoop, whoop. Oh, more hassle. Oh, I know. I'm worn out. Oh, sometimes you spend most of the day just finding out who wants what. It's such a waste of time and energy. Yeah which we ought to be spending on making the clothes we need to exchange for food. There must be a better system. There must. Yeah, but, but what? Do you remember last winter, when everybody was short of corn? Mm. Well, if you, if you had corn, you could swap it for anything. Mm. You never had to go round and round from one person to another, collecting things you didn't want, to swap for other things you didn't want, till finally you got the things you did want. You just swapped everything for corn. You could even keep it till next week or next month if nobody had what you wanted that market day. That's all very well. You didn't have to lug those things to market and back when you couldn't swap them. And when harvest time came, you could hardly give the stuff away. Hmm. Hey, but, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. But suppose there's something someone always wanted. Suppose there's something we could use, like we used corn last winter. Something like water, for example. <laughs> <laughs> What? But they've got as much as they want of it. And if they haven't, all they've got to do is drop a bucket into the river. It's theirs for the taking. Hmm. Strawberries? They go bad after a couple of days. So, it's got to be something everybody wants and nobody ever has enough of. It mustn't be too heavy and it mustn't ever go bad. There ain't no such thing, my dear. Yes, there is. What? These! <laughs> the coloured stones I sometimes find by the river? Yes! Every 
everybody wants them for, for rings and bracelets and necklaces, and there aren't too many around. What a great idea. Why don't we... Hold on. I've thought of a snag. What? Suppose one of these is worth a dozen eggs. Well, then you simply swap it for a dozen eggs. But suppose you only want half a dozen eggs. Oh, I see what you mean. Can't break it into smaller pieces. I've got it. That's it. What? Gold. We could use gold. Nobody ever has enough of it. You could swap a very small amount of it for an awful lot of meat or eggs or cloth. It keeps forever, it doesn't even rust, and you can divide it up really small. Brilliant! Absolutely brilliant! So, that's what we persuaded everybody who used the market to try out. Every family got all the gold it could spare and took it round to Mr Smith. Then he melted it down and made it into small round pieces for them. Some were bigger than others and some were small enough to carry in your pocket or your purse. See? Ooh, shiny, <laughs> aren't they? Then, of course, shopping in the marketplace became so much simpler. If you couldn't do a straight exchange, say a new shirt for Mr Coward's butter, because Mr Coward didn't need a new shirt, you could give him some of your gold in exchange tokens for the butter instead, and he would use them to buy the salmon he did want. And the nice thing was that in the end, the person who did want your shirt would arrive with the exchange tokens, swap them for the shirt, and you'd be back where you started with the same number of exchange tokens you started with. And with the butter you wanted instead of the eggs you didn't want. <laughs> In history, all sorts of objects have been used for money and still are. Iron rings, shells, even tobacco. Though precious metals have been the most popular because they can be easily divided into smaller pieces and because they don't corrode or rust. Eventually, less precious metals such as copper and bronze were to take the place of gold and silver. However, there used to be a problem because any metal could be debased by mixing it with a cheaper metal. To stop that, they used to test the purity of the metal and then stamp it with a special mark, an animal or the head of a king or queen to authenticate it. Also, people used to clip small pieces off the edges of their coins. To stop that, they specially milled the edges to make it obvious if somebody cheated. The system in a similar form can be seen today. These days, printed paper money has mostly replaced coins as a medium of exchange. Today, everybody uses money without having to think about either its origins or what it consists of. But the important point to understand about it is that, of itself, it has no special value. Its value lies only in what you can do with it. Money itself is simply a mechanism for making it easy to exchange things like the people are doing in this market now. But of course, money has other advantages. It's very hard to swap, say, a pound of strawberries for a pound of peaches, for instance, because strawberries are finished by June and peaches don't ripen until August. But if you sell the strawberries, the money will store their value until August when you can buy your peaches. And money is also a useful measure of worth. If everything has a money price, you can compare the values of a piece of land, a flock of geese, a six months hard work by a carpenter, which otherwise are very hard to compare. It's funny to think that although money itself might be worth almost nothing, it happens to be...